I hope that you have a copy of God's Word. If you do get it out, you will definitely need it today and open up to Romans chapter 1. Uh, we'll be flipping through quite a bit of Romans, basically Romans 1 through 6 uh, this evening, uh, hopefully relatively quickly. Um, Romans has always been one of my favorite books in the Bible, one of my favorite letters that Paul has written. And we have two weeks to cover the entirety of Romans, which is absolutely impossible to do. Uh, I'm extremely excited for this next season of Amplified to actually have a series where we sit down and try our best to study all of Romans. But tonight we're going to look at a glimpse of Romans 1 through 4 and then a little bit of Romans 6 through 8 um, and hopefully give you a better understanding of what's happening in Romans but then also talk about a dangerous counterfeit gospel that I could not get out of my head as I was just reading one sentence from Romans chapter 6. So that's the plan for the short amount of time we have this evening. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us now. Uh, a little bit late, but thank you for joining us, uh, Amplify students. And if you are not an Amplify student, I am so glad that you have joined us. Um, you sh if you're an Amplify student, you know that we are currently uh, walking through the Bible. We've been doing it for the past eight months now, and we're definitely on the final stretch. Um, I think we have about seven weeks left uh, before we are in Revelation and we are finished up with uh, our story through Scripture. And so we've went Genesis to right now Romans, and we're right here at the end. We only have a little bit left, so uh, bear with us. And if you have kept along with the reading plan, um, congratulations. I'm so happy that you have. And if you haven't, now is a fantastic place to just jump back in and read through Romans. So we're going to go through it relatively quickly now, but I would greatly encourage you this week to sit down and read all of Romans, because I'm going to teach on about the first half this week, and then next week, Josh Cribb is going to be teaching on some of the end of Romans. And so if you haven't read through it, go ahead and jump into Romans, starting tonight, read Romans 1, and work your way through it, and finish it by next Wednesday. So, without further ado, we're going to jump uh, right into it, and I'm just going to give a little background of what the book of Romans is. And so, it is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. Um, many of you know who Paul is, but he was, um, he used to go by the name Saul. He was a Jewish Pharisee who was in love with the Torah and the law and he stood firmly on it and he saw Christians, those who were following this Jesus as blasphemous and dangerous to the Torah and the law and the Jewish faith and he was persecuting these Christians and so he actually had a radical supernatural encounter with Jesus um, that changed his life and Jesus set him aside to carry his gospel to the Gentiles, which were people who were not part of the Jewish faith, or Jew, the, the Jewish nation, sorry, not the Jewish nation, not people part of the Jewish nation. <clears throat> and so Paul set off on this journey. He uh, had an amazing missionary journey. And what Paul would do is he would go around, he'd be planning small churches of believers, and he would write letters to these churches, either further explaining biblical doctrine or just giving revelation from the Holy Spirit, and also correcting um, these churches in many ways. And so what's happening in the book of Romans is that at some point during the reign of Claudius, he expelled all of the Jews from Rome, and then five years, and that included Jewish Christians, followers of Jesus. And so five years later, um, when these Jewish Christians re-enter Rome, they find this church that is extremely divided. You have a church of uh, Gentile Christians 
who um, are not circumcised, who are eating whatever they want to eat and are not abiding completely by the laws and the Torah. And then you have this group of people who are Jewish Christians who are circumcised, who are eating just uh, kosher and who are following these laws very strictly and they are kind of battling each other. Um, you have the Jewish Christians wanting the Gentiles to be circumcised and to follow their ways and you have the Gentile Christians saying did you not listen to the words of Paul we are saved by grace and this circumcision is not physical but uh, an internal circumcision of the heart and <clears throat> so you have this uh, division going back and forth. So you have this extremely divided church in Rome. And then here comes Paul writing this letter to this divided church. And that is what the book of Romans is. And so the Ro book of Romans starts off the first four chapters really are explaining uh, both the righteousness of God and it uses the righteousness of God to ex they explain the righteousness of God using the sinfulness of man. So Paul starts off his letter by writing to the Gentiles and explaining their sinful nature and their sinfulness. And it's a pretty hardcore, um, I don't want to say beatdown, that's almost what it feels like, is a beatdown on these Gentile Christians. Just to read a part of it, uh, if you just look in Romans chapter 1 after the, um, after the famous verse of not having an excuse of God's um, nature being displayed around us in his creation <clears throat> and yet he says that people worship the creation rather than the creator and even though they knew God they disobeyed God but if you look down in verse 28 chapter 1 verse 28 it says and they did not see fit to acknowledge God God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done they are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they knew God's righteous degree, decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And so that is a pretty huge correction to these Gentile people, letting them know, like, no, you are completely lost and bound in your sin. And I can just picture, you know, this, this church going right now. You have one side of the room, you're Gentile believers, and one side of the room, you got your... Jewish believers and these Jewish believers at this point when this letter is being read are just <clears throat> you know jumping and praying like yeah we've been trying to tell you this the whole time look how bad you guys are but then when you get to Romans chapter 2 Paul turns to the Jewish people and he has a word for them so if you look in Romans chapter 2 I'm just going to read quickly verse 17 uh, through 24 it says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having the law, the embodiment of the knowledge and truth, you then who teach others do not teach yourself. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? While you say that one must, com must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And then you can jump over to verse 9 in chapter 3. and says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Gentiles, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. 
The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And so Paul is speaking now to the Jewish nation, telling them, like, listen, you had the law, you had the Torah, you knew what you were supposed to do, and yet you were completely indulged in idols and impurities and sexual immoralities, and you too are guilty and bound by your sin. But there is good news here. So Paul goes to an extent to point out the bondage of sin that is upon the Gentiles, upon the Jews, and then Romans 3, 21 through 26 comes along. And I'm going to be reading a lot of scripture, so please try to follow along with me. So Roman. It's 3, verse 21, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so, we see a beautiful picture of mankind, Jew, Gentile alike, being redeemed and justified by the grace of God. <clears throat> and there's so, there's so much more that you can look at in that chapter, uh, but what comes next, so you told you, so 1 through 4 is kind of a section of, we're showing God's righteousness, His justness, and they do that by pointing out our sin and our salvation that is through Christ. And then chapter 4, you have salvation through, talks about salvation through faith. It talks all the way back to Abraham, who was before the law, and yet he was declared righteous because he had faith. And so talking about salvation through faith, <clears throat> and then you jump over to uh, chapter 5, which we're actually going to... Talk a little bit more about five in the beginning of six and a little bit in the middle of six. Like I said, I'm going to read a lot of scripture, um, and there's not going to be as much teaching, but there is something that has really stood out to me as I've kind of looked through mainly chapter six. And one thing just keeps jumping out every time I read through it. But I want to, before we start looking at it, I want us to kind of look back at what we have talked about in the weeks previous. We've talked about how and why we are saved. And so we have talked through looking at Ezekiel 36 and Galatians 2, that, and even here in Romans, that we are not saved by our own works. Rather, we are solely saved by the grace of God. And we figured out why that was by looking at Ezekiel 36. We see that God saved his people for the sake of His great name, for the sake of His glory among the nations, that the Jew, that the Israelites were profaning His name among the nations. And we saw right there in Romans chapter 2 that the Gentiles um, disobey God because of the Jews profaning His name. And so we see that God um, interacts and God reaches His hand down and He saves the Israelite people in Ezekiel 36 from um, <clears throat> this deportation, from this, uh, just lost the word, um, it'll come back to me in a second, but so he saves his people because he was worried about his name. And so we see, we've talked about it, that we are saved by God's grace for his glory among the nations. <clears throat> and I think and I truly believe that ties so deeply here into Romans 6. Because I started, as I was just reading through the passages that I had to teach from this week, <clears throat> Romans 6 kept popping out to me. And it's really the very first verse in Romans 6 that pops out to me. The fact that Paul even had to ask this question. The fact that this was even brought up was blowing my mind. But then I started thinking about it and I understood. And it's a question that 
needs to be brought up in the American church today. And that question is, so Paul says in Romans 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Now the reason he says that, <clears throat> so we got to bounce back a little bit. So he says, what shall we say then? So that then knows, okay, he just made a statement back here in Romans chapter 5 that we need to look back on. And I don't want to go through the entire thing, but one that really sums it up is verse, chapter 5, verse 6. For while we are still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. By the death of his son, much more now we are much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You can jump down a little bit, it goes over and over and over again, explaining Christ saving us from our sin and grace abounding over our sin <clears throat> and how this original sin from Adam has entered all humanity. And Paul's already mentioned this in Romans 1, 2, and 3, explaining sin in all the world, but how he has received glory in the saving grace of Jesus over all of our sins. <clears throat> so then the question arises, what shall, what shall we say then? Should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Should we continue to sin so that God may continue to shower us with his grace and receive glory by forgiving us over and over and over again and showing that grace. And to me, that is an absurd question. And Paul agrees that's an absurd question. He says, by no means. He says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Last week we read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where we talked about becoming a new creation. And we mainly talked about kind of having a new hurts in our hearts for the things that hurt God. I asked you the question, what keeps you up at night? What are the things that burdens your heart that God has burdened you with? And <clears throat> The reason that I bring that up is because this passage is almost um, bringing back this idea of us becoming a new creation, that we walk in the newness of life. And if you continue reading in Romans 6, you'll see that we are certainly new people and that we have been raised into this new life with Christ. And we are called to live in his justification and in the righteousness that has been given to us and to pursue our sanctification. Those are a lot of big words that I promise we will um, expound upon more um, justification and sanctification as we study through Romans. We've already talked about it some in Amplified, and we will glance over them. Actually, we'll study them more in depth as we study Romans as a whole um, in months from now. <clears throat> but what I want us to look at now is the fact that when we ask that question, there's a lot of people that most people are going to have the same response as Paul. By no means. And he even asks it again further down in verse 15. says, what then are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And again he says, by no means. We are now slaves to righteousness. But what started breaking my heart is I have heard story after story after story. And I've heard other people explain this to me, trying to explain their gospel. I'm going to go ahead right now and tell you it is a counterfeit and a false gospel. Um, and it's a false gospel of theological liberalism is what it is. And at the root of theological liberalism is this idea that our sin is so small and unimportant. And there is so much in theological liberalism and Basically what it is for those who don't know what it is, is we're not talking about atheists, we're not talking about 
other denominations or people who disagree with you or Democrats and Republicans. All right, these are people who profess to be Christians and yet they don't believe in Christian orthodoxy and uh, the foundations of our faith. And one of those foundations is, one, they don't believe in the Word of God, that it stands. They, they try to adapt culture to the modern church. And nowadays, and twist things around to agree more with our culture and what makes them feel good. But the part that I have heard other people share, which I really believe is the, this is the center of theological liberalism, is people continue to sin with the idea that God is faithful and just to forgive. Which is true. Which is absolutely true. God is faithful and just to forgive. But they use that as an excuse to live their best lives now and to live their lives in sin, doing whatever they want and think that all they have to do is sit down and I pray, go, say, God, please forgive me, and then go back out and live their life the exact same way. And I'm here to tell you right now that that is not biblical. That is so far from biblical that it is unbelievable. That theological liberalism is the most dangerous counterfeit gospel that we have to date. That it is bringing so many people into this gospel that is so watered down and whimsical and flimsy and is so self-centered on how we feel and how we want the Bible to be interpreted and how we want God to behave and how we want God to act. And what we're doing is we are damning people to hell for eternity with this horrible gospel. It is a counterfeit gospel and a false gospel. And it is rooted, I firmly believe it is rooted in the idea that our Sin is minuscule and unimportant. And that is not what the Bible teaches. The book of Joel goes to extents to, uh, to use this language describing how we should weep and mourn and lament bitterly over the sin that is in our lives. And even Paul here explaining, no, we are not slaves to sin. If you, if you have been baptized with Christ, that you were yourself was baptized with Him, and you have been raised to a new life, and you are to walk in that new life. And what I'm not saying that we will never sin. The issue is that we think our sin is okay, that we are not hurt by our sin, we are not burdened over the sin that is in our lives. And we just think that God is just up there all the time. He, he, we, we get this idea that He needs us and so that He will always be faithful to forgive. But that is not why He forgives. Yes, God is so faithful to forgive us of our sins. Yes, yes, yes. But that is not the reason why. It is not because He needs us. It is because that we need Him. That we always need Him. It is never the other way around. And just as I read Romans 6, I just recalled times in my head where people have explained to me this idea of theological liberalism and how they use this idea, they use Romans 3.21 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God as an excuse to sin all the time and that it is perfectly fine. A Christian, listen to me. if. If that is the belief that you have, that is a wrong belief. Yes, we will still sin. Paul calls Paul says he is the chief of all sinners. Okay, so and he's the one who wrote this. Okay, he wrote half of the New Testament. So yes, we will still sin, and we will have the desire to sin. It will be there. Paul even Paul also writes that you know his mind wants to do one thing, but his body constantly wants to do what is opposite of God's will. So yes, there will be times when we fall short. 
100% it will happen. But the difference is, is the Christian who has been raised and who walks in new life will weep and mourn and realize that our sin is the thing that led Jesus to the cross. That it is not something small. When we make our sin something small, we make Jesus' sacrifice something small. We make his atoning death and his justification something minuscule. And it is so far from that that it is unbelievable. The fact that Jesus was weeping in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross, well, Scripture says that sweat was beating on his forehead like blood. The fact that he is in this state of mourning over, over what's about to happen isn't because he's going to go hang on a cross. Okay, Peter uh, was most likely hung on a cross upside down with a smile on his face. And we have other uh, disciples who were hung on crosses and who were preaching the gospel. We have people who die every day with smiles on their face. I heard of a story of a man in India who was being flayed. Okay, skin being ripped from his body. And he was thanking the people who were doing it because he was about to receive his heavenly garments and they were removing the, his earthly garments for him. That is amazing. So how can we see pictures of just followers of Christ being martyred in such an amazing way? Like I hate to use the word amazing, but with a smile on their face, how can Stephen just sit there and say that he sees Jesus at the right hand of God as he is being stoned to death, begging him to forgive the ones who are stoning him? How can that be in Scripture? And then we see Jesus in agony of the idea of going to the cross. And unbelievers who are listening to this right now, please listen into this part. It's not just that Jesus died on the cross for us. It's not that he just went to a cross and hung on for a few hours and then died and then rose from dead. There's something more important going on. He was becoming the ransom for sin, past, present, and future. And he was about to receive, he says in Luke, when he's in the garden, for God to take this cup away from him. Um, when cup is used throughout the Bible, it is referring to the cup of wrath, the wrath of God. And he knew he was about to endure the wrath of God for the sins of all of the world past, present, and future. And that is something that the Son of God was sweating like beads of blood about and in agony in this garden, begging that if it was possible to have this taken away from him. So that's a pretty serious deal. That is the cross. He atoned for our deaths, but more than that, he took on our sin and he gave us his righteousness. That is what justification means. And if you believe that, okay, if you believe that and you have been baptized into his resurrection, you walk in the newness of life, you will look different. You will have new wants and new desires and you will be a new creation. And when you sin, yes, when you sin, it'll happen. When you sin, your heart will break because you know that is the very thing that Christ died for. So let us not minimize our sin. Let us see our sin for what it is and let us weep and mourn bitterly over the sin that is in our life. And I fully believe that if we recognize our sin, if we see our sin for what it is, then we will see the cross in a completely new light and people who may be walking through this theological liberalism or through this nominal Christianity who just go to church or just listen, maybe not going to church now but that's before all this happened, you're just going to a building because that's what you're supposed to do on Sundays because you live in the Bible Belt or you're listening to this video because parents make you watch this video or you could be someone the completely opposite side of the country and this video just pops up on your timeline 
and you're watching it and you're a Christian in name of me and you don't understand that your sin is a big deal. When you finally realize, when you realize that it is not something small, then you see the cross of Christ for what it is. And then the death and his resurrection will become real to you and your need for a savior will become real to you. And if that is happening, if you are watching this and it's happening right now where you realize that your sin is weighing you down, that you're a slave to your sin and that you have never had those chains broken by the righteousness of Christ, then scripture is so clear. Romans 4, Romans 5, we have salvation through faith. And we believe that the death of Christ was more than efficient for our salvation. That we are sinners in need of salvation. We are saved by His grace alone, not by works that we can perform. Then that is all that you need. But you have to truly believe that. Scripture says to believe and repent. And when you believe in a counterfeit gospel like theological liberalism, that does not lead to regeneration and new life. But when you believe in the true gospel that is all through this Bible, then that leads to new life in Christ. And if today you're just you're realizing that you believe this false gospel and you want to believe this true gospel, all you have to do is believe. Know that you are a sinner and that your sin is a big deal. That your sin hurts you and hurts God. And that Jesus' death is sufficient. Then you can have eternal life today. Father God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your saving grace. Lord, we thank you that you had worry for your great name. Lord, that you chose to save us to glorify yourself. And Lord, we thank you that you have saved us so that we would glorify you. God, and I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, for anyone watching this, Lord, that if I made absolutely no sense to anyone, that just the scripture that I read, Father, will pierce them deep, Father. Or just the true word through Romans would meditate in their hearts, and it would lead them to repentance, and it would lead them to a relationship with you. Lord, all it takes is a confession and professing that you are Lord over their lives. Father, we love you and I pray for, pray and expect amazing things to happen. In Jesus' name.